Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study as we continue through the book of Ezekiel or a little bit more than halfway through and uh, with this uh, this lesson this evening we'll be wrapping up uh, we did a short series on, on Lucifer and Satan and the devil and we're going to be wrapping it up and uh, if you were here with us the last few lessons we looked at his fall uh, we looked at the we know that the, according to scripture the angelic beings a third of them fell uh, we have an idea when they fell but we can't uh, emphatically say that is the case because we're only given scant details in the scriptures and we can uh, um, hypothesize from these details but uh, I do believe my personally that uh, Lucifer and his angels the ones he took with him fell before the creation of man but that's just what I believe and this idea causes people a lot of consternation and there's a lot of detractors but there's also uh, many on on that hold to my, my point of view. But uh, we're going to look at some, some verses this morning as we, we wrap this up, but I wanted just to give you some things to think about. We do know and we do believe that Eve was tempted by the devil after Lucifer had fallen. Otherwise, if he had not fallen, he could not have tempted Eve. That makes sense. It just makes logical sense. It's just simply common sense. And if you hold to the position that Lucifer fell after God created man, then you open the possibility that Adam and Eve witnessed Lucifer's fall, correct? If you assume that the Garden of Eden and the Garden of God, Eden and the Garden of God, were both one in the same place, and they both lived together, if you believe that that's the place, then what's the conclusion? That they lived in the same place, correct? If you believe the Garden of Eden and Eden and the Garden of God were the same place, then Adam enjoyed fellowship with the angels, but we know that the Bible tells us that he was, begins with an A, L, alone. alone. The Bible says he was alone. So you have verses to, that you can use to prove the opposite position. We do also know from the book of Job, when we show, show, uh, showed this to you last week, that uh, they were present when God laid the foundation of the earth. Uh, so that was in the book of Job. So we're going to wrap things up this evening, and we're going to pick up in chapter 28, verse 16. And the Bible says here, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, important what God says here, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring, thee, uh, bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. A lot of information here God is giving us in just a few verses. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So now it's obvious here in these verses that uh, as God is speaking to the king of Tyre, he's speaking to who directly? Satan. 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 Uh, remember when he talked to Peter, who was he speaking to? He looked at Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And when he spoke to Judas Iscariot, he said, What thou doest, do quickly. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to the devil because the Bible tells us that Satan entered Judas Iscariot and also Satan entered Peter. That's a shocker for some. The devil can do that, but he can. Now here God is using the activity of the king of Tyre to illustrate, to give us an illustration of what I think perhaps what Lucifer did uh, before he fell. During the time he lived with God in heaven and he resided upon the mountain of God. So now from this verse, we also understand, and get a little bit of conjecture here, but we do know from observing the world, that most commerce in this world is controlled by who? I believe it's controlled by the devil. Uh, because he drives people. Think about this. What drives a man to open up a business? Money. Money. What drives you to pursue a career? Money. Now, we have to be careful here. Is it wrong to pursue a career? Is it wrong to open up a business? No. But what is the motive behind what you're doing? Is it because you love money or because you just want to make ends meet and support your family? See, there's a fine line there. There's a fine line. And we have to be careful. The Bible says, For the love of money is the root of all 
evil. The fiction notes over here. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And if your Bible says all kinds of evil, that's a mistranslation. I'm sorry, get, get a refund. They say, oh, the Greek says all kinds. No, it does not say all kinds. It says all is the root of all evil. They should give back their degrees. Now, I myself am a capitalist, a capitalist, and I want people to open up businesses. I have never been hired by a poor person. Every, every man that has hired me has been a wealthy individual. So I want them to open up businesses because they'll hire people like me. That's how it works, right? Um, we have to live, we have to pay our bills, we have to buy homes, buy food, especially in today's day and age, the food prices have gone up. Uh, I see our discretionary income shrinking uh, because of en rising energy prices and there's no need for that, but I'm not going to get into that this evening. But uh, the problem is when you love money, that's the problem. Uh, you know the poor people can love money too? Mm -hmm. It's not just the rich people that love money. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it doesn't matter what your status in life is, what your income is, you can love money and you have to be careful. And we can assert here in chapter 28 verse 16, we know that it's talking about Lucifer. Because God says, I will destroy thee, O covering a cherub. Uh, you cannot make the case that the king of Tyre ever was in Eden, the garden of God, uh, nor was he upon the mountain of God. So what we've seen so far is the devil was in three places. He was in Eden, he was upon the mountain of God, and he was in the midst of the stones of fire. If you recall from the beginning of our lesson in the book of Ezekiel, what were these stones of fire? What did they present? Anybody remember? Were they representing their tribe? No. no. They were they're literally stones of coals of fire. The angel in the book of Revelation takes them. A-L-T. Altar? altar. It was the altar of God, right before God. There's a big altar right before God. And Lucifer, the, the Bible says, he was in the midst of the stones of fire. But this is referred to in the, in the book of Revelation. You can look at it. We're not going to look at it this evening. And you could also look at it in the beginning of Ezekiel. We, we mentioned that. We gave... Uh, in the beginning of Ezekiel, we've given a very crystal clear picture of what the throne of God looks like and what the whole setting is. And we talked about that. Uh, I want to share one more verse with you that we can say that when Lucifer was created, he did not live with Adam. I don't believe that. He lived in the mount of the congregation. Isaiah 14, 13 says, For thou, referring to Lucifer, hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, who are these stars here? Angels. Angels, angels are referred to two, three, three expressions for well, angels. One of them is angels. What is the other one? Sons stars. Of God, sons of God and stars. 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 That's it. Three, three descriptions. And then we have, according to, to the scripture, what, what we know, how many classes of angels? Three. Who knows what they are? Cherubim, seraphim, and... The regular angels. angels. Right. Regular angels. But they're all called Angel. angels. Just like when you say man in the English language, what are you referring to? Mankind. 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 You're not referring to women. So that's why they, they don't like the Bible, because it says man, but uh, they don't know the dictionary. He says, I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation. You see that? The mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, this is the mountain of God, and it's called the mount of the congregation. Why do you think it's called mount of the congregation? That's because it is the place where God met with his angels. Job chapter 1 verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. So we know that that's where they congregated. Um, there's many, in the Old Testament, many illustrations, many descriptions of what goes up in heaven. And even today, even back in the Old Testament, remember we did in Sunday school class, what did we talk about? Who remembers? God wanted to do what to King Ahab? He wanted to send what? A lying, a, a lying spirit. And who sent the lying spirit? No. God did. And that shocks liberals today. That God would actually send to a man a lying spirit. Would he actually do that? Of course he would. Yeah. If you read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what does God send to mankind? A strong delusion. A strong delusion. That they what? They would believe a lie. A lie. So God does that. You've got to be careful. You've got to always examine your heart before God. The question we have to ask ourselves here, where we're talking about the congregate, the mount of congregation, where did they go? Where did they present themselves to God? Now we know, according to Scripture, God's throne does not what? Does not move. God's throne does not move. It's the constant in the universe. It won't move. I believe everything moves towards it, but nothing moves His throne 
does not move. And I believe they went there up in the mountain of God that's in God's heaven, and they presented themselves where God is situated. And that's where Lucifer was before his fall. And uh, we don't have time to explain this, but heaven is due north, right north. You look up north, you're going to look at heaven. In Psalms 1, 11, 4, the Bible says the Lord is in his, his holy temple. You see that? God has his own temple up in heaven. And the Lord's throne is where? In heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. It's pretty obvious that God has a mountain there. He has his uh, throne there. He has his temple there. And he has his angels who serve before him. And even until now, the evil angels, and even Satan himself has the uh, right, not the right, he has the, not authority, but he still has the ability, the what? The privilege, thank you, the privilege of presenting himself before God. And that will end uh, during the tribulation. Now, I believe here what God says by the multitude of the merchandise, referring to the trade and commerce of the king of Tyre, I believe that God did not create his angels to sit back and just do nothing, or just to worship him all 24-7, unless they were a seraphim. The seraphim is a class of angels that God created for the whole purpose of doing what? Worshiping. Worshiping. When I was a little kid, I uh, read that passage in Revelation. I couldn't understand how somebody could stand before God, bowing and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year with, without end. But as I got closer to the Lord and I matured in the Lord, I understood. Once you get into the presence of God, what actually happens? You praise the holiness of God. You cannot help but praise the holiness of God. We know that Lucifer was upon the mountain of God before he was cast out. And God said he cast him out from the garden of God, which was called Eden. What does that sound like? You can cheat and look at your notes if you want, but what does that sound like? Adam getting kicked out. Adam getting kicked out. You see the, the parallels here? God created Lucifer. He kicked him out because he sinned. And God created Adam, put him in his own garden. And what did he do? He, he sinned and God kicked him out. God does not tolerate sin. Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord sent him, Adam, forth from the garden of Eden. Now don't miss this. To till the ground from whence he was taken. So God took dirt, made Adam, and then he took Adam and placed him in the garden. And here, if you, if you, if you were paying attention, what did God say about that cherub? Where is he going to send him? To, to, to the ground, to the earth, to the earth. Adam was sent to the ground from where he was created, and Satan, at some point, he was going to be cast on, on the earth. Now, I want to share this verse with you that I mentioned before, Genesis 2.18. And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Now, I believe this verse is a, is, is a good verse uh, for people on my side that say that when God created Lucifer and the angels, he did not place them in Eden, the Garden of Eden. He placed them in their own place. He did not abide with Adam because here we are told that Adam was alone. So that's an indication that they were elsewhere. Uh, right now, uh, the earth is not Satan and his angels' home. How do we know that? What book in the Bible tells us that this is not their domain? Who knows? It begins with a J. Mm -hmm. Who said it? No, close. Now we're going to go through all the J books. Somebody gets Jude, right. When the, when the angels in Genesis 6, the sons of God, came to earth, what does the Bible say? They left their habitation. So this earth is not their place. This earth is not their domain. It's our uh, domain. So Lucifer is going to be judged. The Bible says he's going to be, he was cast out of heaven, and eventually he's going to be cast into the earth. And where is his final destination? Lake of fire. Lake of fire. fire. God says from this passage we just read, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they may behold thee. They will see him. They will see him. Revelation 12, 7 through 9, tells us this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Do you see that? Right now they have, they have a privilege. They have rights to go to heaven before God. But when this war happens, they will be cast out of heaven completely, and they will no longer be allowed into heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, 
He was cast out into what? The earth. The earth. God says here in Ezekiel chapter 28, 28, I will cast thee to the ground. Because the, the devil is cast out in, in, in stages. We're going to look at that in a moment. Revelation 20, 10, the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, the beast and the false prophet have the privilege of christening the lake of fire. They'll go there, they'll, they'll pick their own rooms, they'll pick the best place. No, I'm just kidding. But they're the first ones to be thrown in the lake of fire. Now, if you study the scripture, scripture you'll find out that <coughs> Lucifer called the devil, Satan the, the dragon. First, he was cast out of heaven. He lost his position as the anointed cherub. Then he was cast out by Christ. Now start counting. And I gave you the references, so you can say I'm not making this up. Then he was he's going to be cast to the earth, still future. He's going to be cast into the bottomless pit for how many years? Wow. A thousand years. And then he's finally going to be cast into the lake of fire. Did you count? Five. And I gave you the references to make sure I'm not making things up. So five times the fifth cherub will be cast up. Do you see the pattern of God's goodness? <coughs> and what is the number five in the scripture? Number of death. Number of death. It's the number of death. Genesis 5.5. 5. Acts 5.5. 5. Five verses later. Who, who dies in Acts chapter 5 verse 5? Ananias. And five verses later, who dies? Sapphira. Who dies in Genesis 5.5? 5. Now, you think it's a coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> now, we're going to go around there and start preaching our own doctrine, saying uh, five is the number of death, and you don't believe it, you'll be hung? No, we're not going to do that. But just, I don't believe in coincidences. And at each time the devil is cast out, he loses what? He loses authority. And when Christ cast out the devil, what did he lose? Power over death. Death. Where do we find this? Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that's Christ, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And you don't have to interpret that because it tells us who had the power of death. The devil. The Bible tells us. Yes, sir. So, can you flush that out a little more? Like, in what oh, way does the devil have? I would love to discuss short, this. Short answer? The, the short answer is in Christ, you don't have to worry about death. Okay. In the Old Testament, you had to worry about death because you had to uh, maintain your relationship with God till the very end. Okay. How's that for a mm -hmm. second answer? But in Christ, you don't have to worry about it. The moment you are in Christ, you no longer have to worry about death. Death has no longer power over you. Why? Because Christ destroyed that power over death. So in the Old Testament, there are some sins that you committed, you had to pay with how? With your life. With your life. Right? And Saul, the Bible says, Saul is a perfect example. He died for his sin, the Bible says. But we know Saul is where? With Samuel. With Samuel right? So we don't have time to get into that. But 1 Samuel chapter 28, you can read that. God said, Saul died for his sin. So we don't have to, we don't have to worry about death in Christ. The power of death. We're going to die. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we're not going to die physically, but we don't have to worry about the power of death. We don't have to worry about dying uh, for our sin. And without getting in too much detail, if you study the scripture, you'll find out that what God is doing here on earth is basically telling the devil that he is just and unjust. Because when the devil sinned, there was no one to tempt him. There was no one to instigate him. There was no one to offer him the possibility of sin. The Bible says that iniquity was where? Where was iniquity in it regarding Lucifer? Found in himself. Found in him, right? Adam and Eve, they were prone to sin, but they were what? Deceived. Deceived. They were tempted. It was from an external source. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16, the Bible tells us that there's going to be a day when people are going to look at the devil and say, is that the guy who messed things up? Isaiah 14, 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? They're going to look at him and say, Is that the guy that did all this stuff? The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> the guy who 
Yes, is this the guy? That's what they will say. Uh, they will realize that the devil is not as scary as everyone believed him to be. Now, I've seen Christians and they see the devil every, in every place. I, we have to understand that the devil is our enemy. And I think we have to respect him as an enemy. And I hope I'm not using that word right. Not respect him like, you know, bow down before him. No. But just uh, understand his power. Understand what he can do. And you respect that kind of power, and that makes you want to submit and get closer to God. Because only there will you find protection, protection against your enemy. Mm -hmm. But the problem with many Christians is they see the devil behind every corner and in between every crack. I've seen Christians. Have you seen, met Christians like that? The devil did it. The transmission breaks down in the car, the devil did it. Uh, they have indigestion because they ate too much pizza. It's the devil's fault. You know, they stubbed their toe on the, on the, on the furniture because they weren't looking. Where they were going, the devil did it. You met people, I've met people like that. Don't give the devil too much credit. Sometimes it's just simply your own stupidity. Mm -hmm. no. uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's not the devil's fault. Yes, the devil does try you to mess us up. You're going or... That's right. If you're, not, you know, if you're speeding and you, and you get into a car crash, the devil did it. Yeah. Uh, it's not, he didn't do it. You, you were speeding. You were texting while you were driving. <laughs> what was that? The devil made me speed, that's right. He it's pushed called, my foot on the pedal. I'm going to say, if you get an accident, it's calling me off. Of <laughs> Not yet, dude. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're praying that you pass your bar so you can help us out when the time comes. <laughs> so, again, I get the idea that the devil and the angels, or Lucifer and the angels, were involved in some kind of activity. I, I don't believe God created them to be idle. Uh, God created us to do what? To do works. Everybody loves to quote Ephesians chapter eight, verse chapter two, verse eight and nine, but they forget verse ten. That God created works mm -hmm. before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. God wants us to do good works. The Bible says He saved us for us to do good works. Mm -hmm. uh, and here it says, "Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries," in verse eighteen, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Now I can't tell you what that, that phrase really means. What it, God is trying to tell us. But we do know a sanctuary is a place to worship God and a place of refuge. Now, I do believe, again, and I just put my thinking cap on, that when Lucifer decided to overthrow God, it just didn't happen in a split second, in an instant. He was been thinking about it, and he was conspiring. Uh, think about all the millions and millions and who knows how many angels God created. Uh, the Bible says he took how many of them with him? Third. A third. So I don't think this conspiracy took uh, lasted for five minutes. But if it wasn't that the devil decided one day, you know, I'm going to overthrow God now. And he walks up to God and he tries to punch God and God uh, kicks a snot out of him. I don't think it worked that way. Right? But he, there was a conspiracy going on. And I'm sure there were some angels that he couldn't convince them with nothing. And there were some angels that he took, he kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And they finally gave in. I'm just reading between the lines over here. I think it would, took him some time to garner a following. You can't just... Uh, take a third of the angels with you without some elbow grease or some, uh, some, some, some greasing of the hands, some favors like the politicians. Before they pass a bill or before they do anything, they, they go around and say, do I have your vote? Do I have your vote? Well, if you put in $50,000 so my, uh, my mother can get a, a suite, yeah, I'll vote for you. If you put $25,000 so my cousin can start a business, I'll vote for you. Well, it's all, in, all that traffic, all that commerce goes on behind the scenes. Um, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. So the Bible tells us that one-third of the angels went with him. Why one-third? I can't tell you. God does things in threes and sevens, we know that. But perhaps a third of them will have the propensity to follow the deception of Lucifer. Now we go into chapter 20. Any questions or comments here before we go into the next part of the chapter? Because we're going to completely switch topics over here. Yes, sir. Could the reference to sanctuaries possibly mean something like he tried to create sanctuaries for himself? I, mean, I, I know that the Bible doesn't tell us either way. Possibly. Uh, to do with that. He desired worship. Maybe it was his love. Maybe God, he, they had their own mansions their own places, and perhaps he tried to gather a following and start his own cult and have people worship him and say, you are the greatest, you're better than God. I, I'm, I, I'm just paralleling it to like what the Antichrist is going to do by 
you know, announcing himself to be Correct. God of yeah. the temple. Maybe he tried to do something akin to that. I don't know. Well, we do know he tried to be God. We do know that he wanted to be God. We do know that he wanted to be above God. The five I wills of the devil. And God gave him the great... Think about it. He was number two in heaven. Mm -hmm. We see that... Where do we see it in the Bible? There's a type in the book of Genesis. Oh, okay. The number two man. Only in the throne am I greater. Oh, oh Joseph. Joseph and Pharaoh. Same situation. Mm -hmm. What did Pharaoh do to David? He gave he, to, to Joseph. He gave him all authority over Egypt. Mm -hmm. Whatever he tells you to do, do. Likewise, and I think that's a type of the relationship between God and Lucifer, he was above the throne of God, protecting it, covering it. Not that God feared any, over any enemies, but he gave him that position. He honored him with that position. And what did he do with that honor and that position? He blew it. And that's why the... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you think that he made, maybe made him first, and then he saw everything else? Because I'm trying to wrap my head around the angels all saw God's creation. They all saw the true God's power and how even any of them can, you know, we will get I, into the that, best, but I'm just... The best thing I can share with you to help you understand that is look at all the miracles Christ did yeah. when he walked in Israel. Right. And... One of the greatest miracles he did, he rose Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead four days. And the moment they see the miracle, what do they do? They run to the leader and say, we've got to do something. This guy's going to convince everybody that yeah. to follow him. We have to kill him. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I, I think of like, how long did it take Israel to worship you know, false gods after they just saw God deliver them out of Egypt? Yeah, and all the plagues on Egypt. Like, so it's because God, and, and that's where I part ways with Calvinists. Because God gave us free will. God was sitting on the mountain in the world. Right? So there's a theological debate about what our free will actually entails. But without free will, we can't do what? Disobey. Right. In regards to God, there's one thing that God... can't worship Him. Correct. Okay. Without free will, we can't worship God. And that's why I teach that you have the free will to receive Christ as your Savior. And then once you get saved, you're predestined to go somewhere, to be something, to do something. But then it's up to you to fulfill that. God told, tells you, I have works, I want you to walk them. God tells you, there's things I want you to do. God says, I have a plan for your life. And he's going to put the pressure on you to fill, fulfill that plan. But ultimately, it's up to you. Like I tell people, you're saved, right? It's up to you to serve God if you want to. Uh, who forces you to read the Bible? Does God show up every morning on your door, pounding on your bedroom door, say, did you pray today? Did you read the Bible today? He doesn't do that. Uh, who forces you to wake up Sunday morning or whatever day you go to church, or Wednesday night, whatever Bible study you go to? Who's pounding on your door, your door telling you you better go to church? Alarm. The alarm clock. Yeah, who shows the alarm clock? That's right. But God does You see what I'm saying? God gives us free will. He gives us free will. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, whenever I've read Revelation 12, 3 and 4, it sounds like kind of like past tense, yet it's future tense. Correct. Because it's kind of like a mixture it is. of both. So, it, anyway, is. it is. I know it's kind of confusing yeah, it's, to me that it's kind of yet past and future. The whole, the whole chapter of Revelation, the whole chapter 12 of Revelation is a, a brief summary of, of history. Condensed summary, super condensed summary of history. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about past and future okay. in the same chapter. We call that what? You guys should remember. P. Parenthetical. Parenthetical. Uh, comment. Okay. okay look, there's parenthetical. There's parenthetical chapters in the Book of Revelation where God stops the narrative, and then He makes a comment. Okay. Revelation chapter twelve is one of those chapters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but you're right. Yes, it does talk about the past and the future in the same chapter. All right, let's move on. Chapter 28, verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Zidon, and prophesy against it, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. For I will send into her pestilence, and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So every time you hear the Bible talk about Tyre, there's always another city mentioned. Right. Sidon, why is that? They're twin cities. 
If you look at the Tyre was the, the more important of the city, of the two cities, but they were sister cities on the coast of ancient Phoenicia. These both cities are still alive today, uh, alive today. They still exist today, but Zidon was the lesser one and Tyre was the more important one, but nonetheless, they were both important places of commerce. Uh, Zidon or Sidon were, was 20 miles north of Tyre. And when God pronounced judgment of Tyre, he also didn't forget her sister city and he pronounced judgment on her too. And we know through history that in the midst of conquering Tyre, King of Babylon also conquered Sidon. Now we move on in chapter 28, verse 24. God promises Israel that these nations that he's judging now, that there's going to be a day that there shall be no more a pricking briar. You can see that the reference for that is Numbers 33, 55. God told Israel, if you didn't obey me, I will make these nations be a thorn to your flesh. Numbers 33, 55. And to the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So this is a future promise. God says, I'm going to judge these nations. But there's going to come a time, Israel, where these nations are no longer going to be thorns in your flesh, and they're no longer going to bother you. God will judge these nations. <clears throat> now, throughout the scripture, what does God use as the basis to judge four nations? Israel. That's right. How they treated his people, how they treated the Jew, how they treated Israel. Even though today Israel's out of God's will and they did reject the Messiah, the Bible says they are what? They're still God's people. Romans, I'm sorry? Is it, is it the, I don't know if that's a different ahead. verse, apple of his eye or yes. something else? Yes, okay. it's in the Old Testament, the apple of his eye. Uh, they are still his people. Uh, look at Romans 11.28, how Paul describes the people of Israel, the lost. He, the, he, Paul makes a distinction between the saved Jews and the lost Jews. In 11, Romans 11.28, he says, as concerning the gospel, regarding the gospel, they are what? Enemies, Enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election... They are what? Beloved. They're beloved for the Father's sake. So if you unwrap this, Paul is saying that they, as a nation, they rejected the gospel. As a nation, they rejected their Messiah. And who were the first persecutors of the church? The Jews. The Jews, the Jews persecuted the Christians. The first people to persecute Christians were the Jews. Who came next? The Romans. The Romans came next. And then who followed the Romans? Catholics. The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. Uh, and during the Inquisition, uh, it lasted, I think, 100 to 200 years, they documented every Christian they killed. Yeah. 68 million. And a few years ago, about 10 or so years ago, the Pope that then was, I believe it was Pope John Paul, he officially apologized for the Inquisition. I don't know if you guys remember that. Some of you guys may not have been old enough. What was that? Exactly, he's proving it. That was his I fault. want Catholic reparations. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I want to check. Yeah, here, put Star your name on this special <laughs> list. There's 68 million people ahead of you. <laughs> That'll be the first I list they tally up. Yeah, what, what was that, Connor? Hey, I said, I'm going to with Catholic, so I should give reparations. <laughs> Great yeah, yeah. My great grandfather was burnt at the stake. I so. can't have. I have to go far back to find the Catholics in my family tree. Okay. They're, they're from. They're Greek Orthodox, about the same, right? Now, so Paul is saying is regarding gospel, they're enemies, but regarding election, they're God's people. God still loves them. Election has nothing to do with salvation, and you've uh, I've taught this before, and you can prove it through the scripture. <laughs> So the Jews are both enemies and the elect at the same time, believe it or not. The Bible calls four groups of people the elect. Well, the four, one of them is not a group of people. The church is called the elect, and we're not going to spend time on the doctrine of election this evening, but you can look it up. The church is called the elect. The angels are called the elect. The Jews are called the elect. And Christ is also called the elect in the Bible. And how do you figure that out? Through context. Sometimes it just says the elect angels. Christ is God's elect. Uh, the, the Jews are God's elect people. So it has nothing to do with salvation. Election has to do with God choosing you, selecting you for a particular purpose. God chose Israel through whom he would bring the Messiah. God chose Christ through whom he would bring salvation. God chose the church so we can preach the gospel and be a holy and peculiar people unto him. And God chose 
the angels as ministering spirits. The book of Hebrews calls them that. So now we come to the end of chapter 28. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because I believe this is a very important uh, teaching that called the restoration of Israel. And in, let me read the passage first and we're going to spend some time discussing it. 28.25 Thus saith the Lord God, When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land. See that? They're going to dwell in their land that I have given unto my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgment upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. So this is the second time God talks about the restoration of Israel. Chapters 34 through 37 of the book deal extensively with this topic, that God will one day restore Israel in the future. And the first time we mentioned that, we came across this topic, was chapter 16. And God says in Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, verse 60 through 62, uh, what do we say about chapter 16? It's the longest? What? Chapter. Chapter where? In the, in the book of Ezekiel. the long, In one of the longest chapters in the Bible. I believe it's the seventh longest chapter in the Bible, and the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16. And God says, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee, now here is referring to Jerusalem, in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee a what? An everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways, and be ashamed, when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder sister, and thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant, and I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, when you see the word covenant in the Bible, you're, don't let your mind race, because there's many covenants in the Bible. God has many covenants in the Scripture, so context will tell you which covenant he is talking about. Now, just as a brief summary before we go on, in chapter 16, who is God talking to? He says Jerusalem, right? Who does Jerusalem represent in chapter 16? This is just going to, I'm leading to something here. Correct. Jerusalem represents Israel in Ezekiel chapter 16. And then he says her sisters. Who are the two sisters? They both begin with S. Sidon? No. Samaria. And who's the other sister? Sodom. 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 Samaria and her younger sister, Sodom. And who does Samaria represent? Well, no. The Northern Kingdom. And who does Sodom represent? The LGBT. <laughs> the what? So the LGBT community. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the LGBT community. No, Sodom represents the, the Southern Kingdom. The Southern Kingdom. And uh, you'll see why in a moment. So, God uses a lot of typology in the scripture, and you have to be careful that you understand the typology that he uses, and you don't run with it. So here in this chapter, he decides to use Jerusalem to represent the entire nation of Israel. He decides to use Samaria to represent the northern kingdom, and he decides to use Sodom to represent the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom. Why does he use Sodom instead of Jerusalem? I gave you hints as I was talking the last 15 seconds. Because? Because? Jerusalem represents the whole. The, the whole Israel. So you can't use Jerusalem to represent the southern kingdom. Uh, where do you get that from? Revelation 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called what? Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, if you study the scriptures, you'll find that God loves to use proverbs, parables, typology, allegories, metaphors, similarities, Onomatopoeia, all the stuff that you learn in English class but you don't remember. Uh, and what I've done here, I'm not going to spend time with that, but I've given you a, a nice little link where this article, they're not King James, but they go through all the literary tools that God uses in the scripture. Interesting article. If you can wanna, if you're interested, you can read that. Uh, so what we, what are we talking about here? God says, when I have when I have gathered the house of Israel. So when you read this, you're inclined to assume, and, uh, and I, we understand why we're inclined to assume, this is referring to the gathering of Israel 
after the Babylonian captivity. After the 70 year Babylonian captivity, God allowed his people to return to Israel. But what do we know about this thing? What do we know about the return after the 70 year captivity? They didn't all go. Say again? They didn't all go. They didn't all go. Many of them stayed in Babylon. Why? It was comfortable. They had businesses, they had homes, they had families, they had uh, well, gardens. They were established. They were rooted. They were there too long. They were. That's right. They were there too long. They established roots. They said, I'm not going to go anywhere. And you see, that's the type of the Christian today. He has too many roots in the world. And he can't serve God. Uh, he doesn't have time for church. He doesn't have time for prayer. He doesn't have time for this. He doesn't have time for that. Because he has too many roots in the world. Too many roots in the world. Now, when we read these two verses, this is talking about a future restoration of Israel. Because if you, if you take this passage, in this passage we see four things that Israel will enjoy when they return to the land. One, God says, they will be sanctified among the heathen. They will be respected by the surrounding nations. Number two, they will dwell in the land. That's all of it. They shall dwell safely, and they shall dwell with confidence. Number three, God says, I will have executed judgment upon the surrounding nations. And we know these are the goat nations. And number four, at the end of these two verses, God says, And they shall know that I am the Lord God. Now, if I were to ask you, is this Israel today? No. No. Because it's still yet future. And, and I believe the scattering, the gathering, uh, that the Jews will be scattered again. Bible in the book, if you study the book of Revelation, they will be scattered again. The Antichrist, once he get, gets on the throne, because of God, the Bible says he's going to make war against the saints. He's going to make war against the saints. And they're going to be scattered, and they're going to flee. What does Jesus tell them? When you see the abomination of desolation that Daniel speaks about, flee, run, and pray that your journey is not on the Sabbath. Pray that you, you're not pregnant. Pray all these things. Pray that it's not winter. Pray this. Pray that. Because you're going to have to run when you see that. Why? Because he's going to persecute. Once the devil gets into the Antichrist, he's going to persecute the saints of God. And we know from history, after the Babylonian captivity, only approximately 50,000 Jews returned in three waves. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. The rest remained in Babylon. Now we covered in Lesson 13, we showed you, if you look at the demographics of the Jews across the world and the land, uh, many of them, more than half, are still living outside Israel today. They're not in the land, and they don't have the land. They only have a small portion. They only have one-tenth of the land that God promised them. And in the, in the uh, book of Genesis and many of the lessons, we have shown you the extent of the land grant that God gave Abraham. It goes from what two rivers? The river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, from what sea to what sea? Mediterranean. Mediterranean to the what sea? Red sea. To the Red Sea. Med Red Dead Sea. Okay, what, what was that? <laughs> Help, hopefully that's a neat acronym. What is it? Med Red? Uh, I don't remember. I just remember Med Red Dead, and I can't remember the last one. Med Red Dead. Okay. Yes, that's how I remember. Mediterranean, Red Sea, and the Dead Sea. Yeah. But their uh, eastern border is the Syrian desert. Right? The northern border is the Euphrates River. The western border is the River of Egypt, which is now dried up. It's called uh, Wadi al-Arish. If you look it up, that's the River of Egypt. That was the border. And then the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Now, I just want to take some time here. Uh, many of you may have not, if you may have heard of this, may not have heard of it, maybe new, maybe foreign. But I, as we get into the restoration of Israel, we have to call these things out. I believe that the Israel is still in God's plan, still in God's prophetic calendar, but there's, there are those who believe that God is done with Israel, that God's completely done with Israel, and that Israel is no longer God's chosen people, and that the church has replaced Israel. You find this is called replacement theology. How many of you heard that? Replacement theology. It's also called supersessionism. It's also called fulfillment theology. And this is found predominantly in covenant theology. Uh, covenant theology has a more nuanced view regarding the relationship between the church and Israel. They say that Israel has been expanded to include the Gentiles. Uh, just FYI, for your information, uh, the people who adhere to this covenant theology are what? They're also Calvinists. Look it up. Who is a proponent of covenant theology? Calvin. Ardent teacher of it? John Calvin. 
John Calvin was an ardent teacher of covenant theology. Most reformers who came out of the Catholic Church were also adherents of the covenant theology. Baptists are not reformers. We, what were we called in the past? Anabaptists. Anabaptists. Baptists are not Protestants. They did not split off the Catholic Church. Uh, the Lutherans did. The, um, sorry? The Presbyterian. Pro Protestant is an overarching denomination that encompasses all the uh, denominations that came out of the Catholic Church. There's a lot of them. Uh, we talked about it during the church history. Uh, pro uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Lutherans, uh, a lot of them were reformers that came out of the Catholic Church and they were actually led by former Catholic priests. Martin Luther himself was what? He was a Catholic priest. And Zwingli and uh, Knox, and we can go on and on and on, we can go. And they came out of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church used to believe, now they've toned the look, they've, they've softened on their stance, they used to believe that they replaced Israel. And, that, and therefore they wanted what? Kill them. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's correct. And they also wanted something else to establish their claim. They wanted a particular city. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. If they had Jerusalem in their hand, they could, they could uh, verify, they could say that, look, we are now Israel. We replaced Israel. The Catholic Church is, everything belongs to the Catholic Church. That's, and they believe that. Now, they've actually softened this idea. So if you go read some of their modern writings, they don't stress that as much. They have to acknowledge that Israel is still a nation. But God gave Abraham an eternal covenant that his physical seed would be as the stars of the sky in numbers. Now, this is repeated oftentimes in the Scripture. So when God repeats something more than once in the Scripture, you are to take it what? Important. It's important and you are to take it at face value. It's called the law of double mention. When God mentions something, you take it at face value. Many times in the scriptures, God says, I will make your seed as the stars of the sky. Now, science tells us there are approximately 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. Or to put it another way, they say 200 sextillion. So if God says, let me read it to you. Sextillion. Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Who is he, who is he saying this to? Abraham. Now, there's a lot of stuff that God promised Abraham. A lot of stuff. We're not going to look at that this evening. But this is one of the things he promised him. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. I believe that. I believe that. Because in Isaiah chapter 9, 6, it tells us, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. no end. I believe that. Only God could do something. If you think about that, your head's going to spin. Uh, no, don't, 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 I don't want your head, head to start, heads to start spinning. I'll give you another verse. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. We're not there yet. Israel does not possess the gate of their enemies yet. Science also says that there are about the same number of stars in the observable universe as there are sands of grains in the earth's beaches. Where did they get that idea from? Grains of, grains, sand grains in all of earth's beaches. Where do you think they got this idea from? Because they count that. You can, you can, you can... It takes a lot of math, but you can do it. Oh, no. You math. take a little square, you count the sounds, and, and then you find the uh, volume of that square, and you just, uh, it's just a whole bunch of math. Just, but you can, you can actually apply some. Yes. I thank God that he has them counting the sand, because I, I don't there's know. There's a lot. He's trying to say there's a lot. There's a lot. Right. There's a lot. Yeah. But when God repeats something over and over and over and over and over again, yeah, it's important. you take it at face value. <laughs> Amos chapter 9, look at this here. I want to give you a couple of verses. And there's a lot of a lot of verses in the Old Testament that talk about the restoration of Israel. A lot. So you have to say, why does God talk about it? Because it's going to happen. Because it's going to happen. Because for Israel, God is not done with Israel. Correct. He's not done with them. Amos 9, 13, 14, and 15. I will read this to you. Behold, days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman 
shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth the seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord God. You'll see that throughout the scriptures. God promises Israel that there's going to come a day where God says, I'm going to bring you to your land, and no one's going to take you out of it ever, 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 ever again. There's some references here, 2 Samuel 7.10, Ezekiel 36, 8-15, which we'll get in a few lessons, and Jeremiah 31, verse 40 through 46. And once we get to chapters 34 through 37, we're going to get into the, uh, the restoration of Israel. So now I see I'm a little over time. I did want to get into uh, chapter 29, but uh, I don't want to keep you guys here longer than you want to stay, and then you'll complain and won't come back. But uh, let's just stop there, and we'll pick up our chapter 29 next, next week.